When I first came here, I thought all people would be officially Russian. From what we'd been told before, only Russian people live here, and all people there. And then, after many months, I learned that there's another ethnicity, which is called Caucasians. They were the first I learned about, because we were taught about them there, in the academy. They were there too. They said, we are from the Caucasus, we are called Caucasians. We're from here and there, our other ethnicities, but we are not Russian. Well, we are officially from Russia, but we are not Russian. There's one called the Bashkirs, and they're also the Tartars. I didn't know about them at first, because they all look similar to Russians. And later, we were told that they are different ethnicities too, not Russian. But they all consider themselves to be Russian, and the Tartars too. They see themselves as Russian and consider themselves Russians. That is why it's difficult to distinguish them. Even now, though I've lived here for seven years, I can't tell them apart. Мы украинцы. Мэнг Хайнг. Ми Мариулана. Мах Иротастам. Эбер Чавашсэн. Имаста Элинес. Чон Лизги Арья. Ми Удмурт Йос. Анахну Иудим. Вирзин Дойчен. Бис Крызбас. Бис Казахбас. Бэта Башкортар. Мининг Милитэм Туркмен. Чон Варт Картолеби. Мото Дике. Uh, cardboard headdress, short pinafore dresses, red boots, daubed faces, cheats reddened with beetroot, hats with ear flaps, vodka, balalaikas, bears. These are all stereotypes about Russia, the way Russians are imagined or what others want us to be. Armenians are very enterprising, but people say they are cunning. And then, we are small people, but we have a rich history. When you tell the truth, people think you are boasting. Right? Maybe we have such traits, but you cannot call Koreans precisely secretive. Koreans are, how do you say it? More cautious, more reserved. A Russian person can sometimes blurt out, but we, in a way, restrain ourselves a little. There's probably such a stereotype that the Jews are tight-fisted. I mean, there are many jokes where this quality is laughed at, but again, it's not tight-fistedness, it's an ability to live frugally. We can save on anything, even on things one shouldn't save on, and of course, there are a lot of jokes about it. In a cemetery in Odessa, there's an inscription on a gravestone. Here lies a wonderful ear, nose, and throat doctor, Isaac Lazarek Zuckerman. His loving son is still working in the same office Monday to Friday from 10 to 6. 
It's easy to explain what kolhol is. All the dictionaries, such as Dahl's and others, explain it very simply. Let's take the Kozaks from Zaporozhnya and other Kozaks as well. They lived in unhygienic conditions. Kolhols, as Russians say, that is Ukrainians, shaved their heads clean to keep different bugs from settling there. But Ukrainian men have two things to be proud of. One of them is their hair, their top knot, so it is called. And they left only a little crest over here, a little top knot, lock of hair. Then it became just popular to do it, and so it came whole whole. The Chuvash are often called a dirty nation. Where does it come from? One of the possible explanations for such a name is that there's a part of Chuvashia from which the people are called black-footed. In Chuvashian, it's hura ura, and they are black-footed because for foot wrap, or as foot wrap, they use black cloth, and in everyday life too. That is why they are black-footed, hura ura. Popular belief is that Germans are descendants of POWs who remained in Russia after World War II. But that is not true. Germans first came to Russia a long time before World War II. The first references of Germans in Russia date as far back as the time of Princess Olga. One of the biggest waves of German immigration to Russia was in 1763, with the Manifesto by Catherine the Great, which allowed Germans to settle in the Volga region. In the Ural region, it was even earlier, at the beginning of the 18th century, when mining engineers from Germany came to the Urals. What is typically associated with Russians? Well, it's of course some kind of great-heartedness, right? It's this mysterious Russian soul, a man always ready to come to the rescue, even if he has to give the shirt off his back. And at the same time, they are very quarrelsome, prone to engage in conflicts with their neighbors. Well, in a word, that is the mysterious Russian soul. And here to say, we can remember an account of one particular episode from the history about a priest somewhere in the Perm region. People often complained about him. They complained that he harassed women, that he asked for and extorted some worldly goods. And in the end, when all the men gathered and wanted to beat him up, he locked himself in one of the city towers, a defensive tower, and used a musket to fire back. And when he ran out of bullets, the men broke into the tower and drove him to the wall. He dropped his musket, and it's written that these were his exact words. My soul has had its jolly time, and now I am content. Well, I guess it's something like that, right? Наш дом. Урал наш дим. Урал минман портня. Урал я ничего не имею ресахли. Урал обайт шелану. Урал ист он за хаос. Урала мертунне. Урал бездин вьюбус. Перинкил Урал. Урал хуней мост. Урал бедвен эй. Урал махажеру. Урал ин ури тиви мида. Бездин и Урал. Урал минен уйм. Таурал я и на то спитимас. Урал жи куал. Урал милям шаермы. The Bashkirs in South Urals and the surrounding areas first appeared in the second half of the first millennium AD. They were different ethnic communities who, as a result of an extremely long cohibition, mixed into just one ethnicity, the Bashkirs. Since old times, even from the 13th and 14th century, so-called Siberian Tartars have lived here. And in the south of the Ural region, on the border with Chelyabinsk region, there was so-called Nagai Knate. In 1552, on October 1st, Ivan the Terrible conquered Kazan, 
And because of this Kazanian tragedy, big groups of Tartars migrated to the south, to the south of the Perm region, and consequently to the east of Svitlovsk region. I mean, what is now Svitlovsk region, here to the Urals. Well, there are reports that the first Russians came to the cis Ural territories at the end of the 11th century. That was a campaign of the Novgorod troop to Yurga, the fur campaign which failed, and later Novgorod warriors made occasional visits to those areas. The proper settling in the Kama River area started only in the 14th century. That was the time when Russian princes came here. Then the Stroganov's patrimonies first appeared here a little while later. In a word, the act of settling of the Urals by Russians, not a temporary residency, started at the end of the 16th and the beginning of the 17th centuries. The Tajiks came to the territory of the Middle Urals in about the 13th to 14th centuries as a part of the caravans which traded with the Ural people who were living here. The first Ukrainians came here with the famous Yermak. He had a small Yermak army, and among them were some Zaporizhian Cossacks. So a lot of them stayed in Siberia, including in the Ural region. Chuvashis first came to the Urals in the 17th century, when they were given plots of land. One of the biggest waves of German immigration to the Ural region is connected with the development of the mining industry. During the 18th and 19th centuries, a great many mining specialists came to the Urals from Germany. Most of the Jews came to Russia at the time of World War II. They were the Jews who came here in evacuation. Here, in the Urals, Georgians haven't been here for long, so to say. Mostly, the majority came during the 1980s. They were students. Koreans came to the Urals in the 1950s, but they were descendants of those Koreans who had immigrated to the Far East back in the 1860s. By 1937, they were resettled to the Republicans of Central Asia and Kazakhstan, and only from there they started moving to the big cities, mainly to get an education. The Greeks were here at the time of the Soviet regime. Mostly, they studied in the construction department sphere. The first owners, so to say, of the construction businesses in Yekaterinburg in the early 90s, they were Greeks. The Talish is an Iranian-speaking nation. Mostly, they came to the Urals in the 90s, so I think. The main place we came from was the Azerbaijan Republic after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Семья. Жануя. Мишпаха. Родина. Семья. Бинанта. Убили. Осра. Ди фамилия. Еш. Икояня. Оджаш. Каджок. Гайля. Машкала. Куа. Хизан. Ойла. Антаник. A family has to be a family. It has to be mutual respect within a family. You should love the young ones, listen to the middle ones, 
and respect the elders. That's how I see it. For the Greeks, a family is quite a loose concept. It includes a mother, a father, the fiancé's mother, the fiancé's father's brother, the fiancé's father's son, etc. It includes all the relatives, all the people who somehow more or less are close to at least one of the relatives. My mom used to work in Georgia as a PE teacher, and one of her students who later also moved to the Urals is a full-fledged member of our family as well, although she is just a former student of hers. They used to live in the same village, and this fact is enough to be relatives. If there is a boy born in a Bashkir family, the moment he becomes more or less conscious, his parents introduce him, for example, to a girl from a friendly family, and as some act of their pre-engagement, he bites her ear. This tradition is inherent to the Uzbeks, for instance and to any Asian nation as well. There are a lot of jokes that go around about Jewish mothers. And of course, everybody knows that Jewish mothers care about their children greatly, always trembling over them and worrying. Here is one of such jokes. A mother is standing on a balcony and calling her son. Shoma, come home. Am I cold, mom? No, you are hungry. My child, for example, initially can't be Russian. But to be a Georgian doesn't mean to be against a Russian. Or to be alien to a Russian. My children were brought up and are being brought up in a Russian culture. We just try so that they know their own roots. I come, for instance, to my daughter's home. She lives in a Russian family. Her husband is Russian. Her mother-in-law is Russian. And I'm already with them, rejoicing at their way of life, you know? I live by that, their cuisine, their holidays that they organize. When they come to my home, I, in return, share with them the same things, but Armenian ones. Tradition. Tradition. Gilea. Tradition.
I would like people around to know about the Mari, about their pagan belief, how close they are to nature and how they communicate with it. Before the Mari cut down a tree, they asked permission from God, Osh Poro Kugo Yumo, the white god the Mari believe in. They asked permission for the felling of this tree, the tree that they chose, the one that should be cut down, but in return they promised to plant a few new trees. If, for instance, we go to the forest, it's desirable, it's better to ask the master of the forest to guard us, not to harm us, and that everything goes well there. Reverence and respect for elders are particularly notable among Koreans. For instance, all the holidays, no matter what we celebrate, we begin with the commemoration of the dead. This aspect is very important. And only after that, the holiday itself is celebrated according to its context and tradition. Shabbat is a very important part of the Jewish tradition, and Shabbat comes every week. It's celebrated on Saturday, although it starts not from Saturday morning, but from Friday evening. For the Jews on Shabbat, it's absolutely prohibited to work, not just to go to work, to perform duties, but basically do anything that is considered to be work or creation of anything at all. In other words, it is not allowed to switch on the light, to write, to drive a car, to watch TV, or to talk on the phone. You can't leave dirty dishes in the sink, otherwise shaitan, an evil spirit, will settle there. You can't leave home in the morning without making the bed first. Shaitan might get under the covers and destroy the family, you know? These things are quite superstitious, but they are very finely directed to ensure that a home is kept clean. And so many people visiting the home say that it's so clean and tidy, as if the guests were expected, although this is on a daily basis for the Udmurts. Let's say that we Georgians have a cult of feast, a cult of wine, a cult... We could say that all this is considered to be very holy for us. By the whole concept of feast, it means that it's prohibited to curse, to quarrel, and to have arguments or scandals at the table. I would say that the main tradition that really isolates us from other nationalities is that we play the kure. It is a plant that basically grows only in the southern Urals, in our region, and we make wooden flutes from it and play our tunes. We like to pattern our behavior on Europe nowadays, you know, but probably not as much as we used to, but at least we like to look towards the West all the time. So, I think what is really worth adopting is a tradition of commonality of small towns, when at any holiday, people of the whole town or whole village, or a part of the town, that is a district of a town, put on their traditional costumes, and these costumes are authentic. People are willing to pay for them, not just a thousand rubles, you know, but for making themselves a nice costume, and as Vyacheslav Zaitsev said, to look great at least once in a lifetime. And they go out and celebrate their holiday. And no one is disturbed that people at their holiday, at their traditional holiday wear, at their traditional costumes, or their traditional dresses. If we are losing tradition, we are losing customs, we are losing language, we are losing culture, and we are losing ourselves. And then who are we in this world? A person without a name? Without a nation? A person of the world? So what? And who are we in the end? And when you have a baby, let's say, he or she asks, what is my nationality? And what do you answer them?
Дружба. Дружба. Мегобруба. Дифроншафт. Энкерюцюн. Дусти. Достык. Достлук. Дуслак. Дослах. Дуствол. Достук. Садаха. Келшамаш. Фея. Едидут. Ламадзинат. Эш ящкон. Хамок. Uh, there are absolutely phenomenal things in Russia. For example, there can be a whole village of Komi people, and all of them are old believers. In everyday life, they can speak Komi Zirian, but at the same time, they use Church Slavonic as the language of divine service. The language is not always that pure, I have to say, but they all have genuine old believers' identity. This demonstrates the way different relationships and scenarios once developed here. And the Russians brought in some, they triggered the development of new relationships. They even acted as a catalyst in shaping new identities, I'd say. In my opinion, my generation doesn't seem to face intolerant attitudes towards Germans of Russia. People of my parents' and grandparents' age surely did experience that, though. If a person had a German name or a surname, school children could often call them a fascist. For example, my granny, whose surname, when she studied at school, was Elgert, and name Elza, was very often, I wouldn't say she was mocked, but people at school weren't always very kind to her, as they used to to call her a German and a fascist. Very often, even teachers, who were sometimes German themselves, could pick on such children. And this is not a very pleasant thing. There were a couple on a bus, I think they were from Asia, and an old man got on. The couple didn't see the man, otherwise I'm sure they would have given up their seats to him. But they didn't see what was happening behind them. And some woman got indignant. Why don't you stand up and offer your seats to the old man? That's what your people do, don't they? It turns out that people only know and remember about the traditions of the other nationality if they can take advantage of them. But they don't remember, and they don't even know the facts they couldn't make use of. So the woman picked that very couple and told them off. And of course, when they saw the man, they gave up their seats. However, there were other young people on the bus, and they weren't rebuked. In the 90s, Caucasus natives were a subject of public attention. Because the country was going through bad times, both politically and economically, very bad times. In order to shift people's attention away from the government, they made it look like people from the Caucasus were to blame for everything. I lived through that. In our city, in 1994, it was all over the papers that the Armenian Mafia was taking over the city. But the Armenians were nothing else but simple workers there. Someone must have needed to spark off that ethnic conflict artificially. But generally speaking, people are all the same. My wife is Russian. My son-in-law is Greek and another son-in-law is Russian. We all keep in touch. A Russian family's everyday life is no different from the one I have. They want to live a good life as much as I do. In the same way, they want to have a big family, many children and grandchildren. Everybody wants that. When I was at primary school, there were children of other nationalities, like the Tartars or Russians as well as the Mari back then. When there was a holiday, like Kochi Pyram, commemoration of the dead, the teachers always let us go home earlier because we had to be at home before 12. 
Sometimes we almost didn't have any classes on such holidays. I'm very grateful to my boss, who being aware of our traditions doesn't make me work late on Friday evenings. On Friday evening, every Jewish woman lights Shabbat candles or Saturday candles. It happens 18 minutes before sunset. And obviously, in winter, it can't be late. It's around 4 or 5 o'clock. My boss knows that I have to light Shabbat candles, and he is tolerant to this tradition. Any nationality living in such a multicultural country should cultivate and promote itself so that more people could get to know you. Then there won't be any questions. Everyone will know who you are. Because oftentimes, when I go somewhere, people say, Ni hao to me. And I go something like, hello, but I'm not Chinese. I'm Korean, you know? So that's that. People are different. I came to Russia in 2009, and here I adopted Christianity in 2012. The problem is that when a Muslim adopts Christianity, it is punishable by the death penalty, according to the Sudanese law. When I told my family that I had converted to orthodoxy, they disowned me. They told me I wasn't their son anymore. That's why I can't return home. Асхана Мидбах Мадбах Кухна Ижа Хуганоц Кучешна Дикухем Кузина Апат Шимиш Кафунар Резоктар Нахар Тамакаш Корео Умсик Шьон Юон Сачмелеб Speaking of Korean cuisine, we should bear in mind that everything that is on the market now, like salads, for example, is not exactly Korean cuisine, but rather a Soviet Korean cuisine that was created by the Koreans who lived in the Soviet Union. It has adapted to the conditions of the places where Koreans live, to Uzbekistan in particular. Vinegar is a must there because it disinfects. We live in a hot climate, you know. People in Korea, on the other hand, don't use so much vinegar. They tend to eat foods in their natural state. Jewish cuisine is very thrifty. That is, Jewish people, if we turn to history, weren't always well off, and they had to learn how to be frugal when making meals. 
We make, for instance, hummus at home. Hummus is a kind of paste made of chickpeas with some lemon and a bit of garlic. A Ukrainian is usually associated with sala because it's a real national asset. And these are not just words. Ukrainian people once survived thanks to sala. A large part of Ukraine was under the rule of the Ottoman Empire back then. But fortunately, Ottoman Turks were Muslims and therefore didn't eat pork. That's why they took everything from people, including cows, sheep, chickens, but didn't touch pigs. And thanks to those pigs and their sala, Ukrainians endured. The favorite dish of the Udmurts from all over Russia is Pelnen. It has already become international. Pelnen is translated as dough which looks like a small ear, but we don't pinch the edges of our pilmeni like Russians do. That's why Russian pilmeni have a bit roundish shape. Our pilmeni remain ear-shaped. Our national dishes are the same as the Bashkirs. We make pancakes the same way, in the same way we cook everything in the stove. Also, we make chukcha, but in our language, it's called tush. We cook it in the oven as well, put some flour, eggs, and some people add sugar. That's it. And when it's ready, we just don't put honey in it. Cilantro, tarragon, parsley, garden cress, and other herbs first appeared here in the Urals. I'd lived here for a while by that time and never seen people make use of them or sell them in the markets. But later on, we started bringing those herbs from home. The locals got interested and started using them when cooking. I think that's the upside of cultural exchange. There is an interesting fact about the strudel. Most of us probably know it as a sweet pastry, but for Russian Germans it is a complete nourishing dish made of potatoes, meat, sauerkraut and dough rolls cooked in the same broth as the rest of the ingredients. I mean, it's not only pastry we're used to seeing in cafes or restaurants, it's also a full main course for lunch or dinner. I've just remembered an amazing thing. At the time when I was young, I never tried a kroshka. One girl invited me to visit her parents, and they treated me to a kroshka. When we left the house, I told her accusingly, why couldn't they serve a hot soup? Why was the soup cold? They didn't warm it up and they gave me cold soup.
1557, the Bashkirs took an active part in the protection of borders of the unified state of Rus. Catherine the Great did not want to have unrest on the borders. Therefore, it was necessary to make the Bashkir and the Tartar tribes obedient. She ordered them to live according to the charter of the Orenburg Cossack troops. Also, a Bashkir Meshurek army was created. We had our own uniform, we had no salary, we used our own ammunition and our own horses, but it was a great cavalry and we were great warriors. From 1813 to 1900, before the revolution, I mean, there were 19 Talish generals in the Russian army. In the early 19th century, Julius Rauner was a pioneer of the bicycle movement in Yekaterinburg. There is a legend that Julius Rauner drove around the town on a three-wheeled bicycle. This example was so contagious that other Yekaterinburg activists eventually joined him. That was the beginning of the bicycle movement in Yekaterinburg. Also, the Germans actively participated in the creation of equestrian and hunting public organizations. There was a big relocation at the beginning of the Great Patriotic War. It was a necessary relocation of plants. Many Euro factories have Ukrainian roots. Among them are Euro Vagonzovod, Euro Himash, and so on, and lots of small plants. And of course, Ukrainian specialists moved here with the factories. On Stalin's orders, tens of thousands of Udmurts were resettled to Tagil to work at the factories and make weapons for the Soviet Union. And of course, many and many thousands of Udmurts have settled in Tagil. I think the most famous Chuvash today is an astronaut, Andrea Nikolaev, who was one of the first humans to fly into space. Marhaban Bikum. Tirasunza Kedeter. Rahimi Tegel. Bari Galus. Gaja Sapu Mitashkom. Kala Sirfate. Laskavo Prosimo. Life in a multicultural society, first of all, enriches the person. He learns the world in all its diversity. He knows not only its traditions, his customs, his cuisine, but he also learns all other people who communicate with each other. And this enriches him. Let's take a simple example of cuisine. I lived many years in Uzbekistan and then in Russia. So in my family, we serve both Uzbek cuisine and Russian cuisine. Koreans can cook, and I myself can cook borscht. We cook dumplings, we can cook plov, shashlik, lagman, and so on. Moreover, we learn the culture of these people, and culture is very diverse. In fact, there are several types of multinationality, and globalization also can be different. There is an American scenario, when everything is blended and mixed in one pot, and it makes a completely new type of human, mentally, and even at the phenotype level, at the level of appearance. 
and it tends to develop in a unique identity. The most vivid example is the American nation. But even in the U.S., there are some nationalities which are against this process. And there is a second scenario. It is a scenario of coexistence. That case, when we consider globalization as coexistence, when globalization does not cross certain borders. As for me, I like the second scenario much more. I think the Urals are a vivid example. It has been a crossroad of cultures throughout its history, starting from the ancient times, and it can be proved archaeologically. It has been the crossroads of cultures where the cultures have been able to find a common ground without disturbing each other without pushing each other. There have been some incidents, but in general, are Russians still alive? Yes, they are. Are the Tartars still alive? Yes, they are. Are the Bashkirs still alive? Yes, they are. Everybody is alive. Well, it is like human relationship, I think. If I don't respect you, you will not respect me, you see? And it is me who must think about it first. This is a wealth that must be used, the vast wealth, human wealth. It is said that there aren't any national resources in Armenia, no oil, no gas, but we have people. That's what we brag about. That's what we are proud of. It should be the same here. If there are many different nationalities in a country, there will be many different talents in a country, and that's always a plus. This is very good for our country. It is very important to live peacefully and respect each other. Also, it is important to respect your culture. Here in the Urals, there are many different nationalities and they have different cultures. Russia unites them all. Дружба. Традиция. Сейчас минуту. Традиция не переводится. Нет, переводится. Арман, по отмашке. Я, я вижу. Бали Галуст. Это а ты торопился вообще? Ага. Шапку не трогайте, все смотрите, вас всех снимают. 
На. Олега, подними ему шапочку. Мама, пусть он плачет. Ласкаво просимо. Да. Ну что ж ты, мужик, а стоишь рядом? Что ты спеши, я голову баню. Чем дальше, тем хуже. Так, Ирасун, давай вот так. Давай, Ирасун, давай. Три, четыре. Ирасун, за, кедетпер.